good morning, undergraduates. For the rest of us, good afternoon. Mm. Um, we're here for a, a very special talk from someone who is very special for the field of Russian studies and Soviet history. It's Sheila Fitzpatrick. Um, she's, she has a, a, a CV that's much too long to read, and I won't, I won't even try. Um, suffice it to say that uh, Fitzpatrick has worked um, um, since the 1970s uh, writing about the Soviet experience beginning at the time of the Russian Revolution and continuing pretty methodically. Uh, and by now she's, she's reached the, uh, the 1950s. And she's been writing, in other words, the, you know, what you'd call in Russian the polne sobrani, sort of the, the complete collection um, on a given topic, and that's the Soviet Union. Uh, few others, I think, have mastered the Soviet period. In fact, no one else has mastered the Soviet period as Sheila Fitzpatrick. Um, I can tell you that in the 1970s, uh, she, uh, I don't think I'm exaggerating, she more or less single-handedly transformed the way we did Soviet history. Because uh, first of all, she treated it as history. And second of all, she began to inject into the Soviet field um, uh, uh, sort of methods that have been common in other fields, which was to look at a country as a population, uh, as a society with social patterns and social forces, and put forward the proposition, which was very controversial in the middle of the Cold War, that the Soviet Union was a country with a society. Um, I mean, it wasn't simply a demonic uh, uh, totalitarian regime, which is how it was well understood at the time, uh, but it was something that has to be understood in terms of people configured in various ways. I think the, the, the way we looked at it in those terms was that it was society. Um, uh, by the time I entered the field, uh, sort of the early 1980s, uh, Sheila Fitzpatrick was the person that I and all of my peers wanted to emulate. And so when we applied to graduate school, it was always, and I would like to do that, you know, exactly what she did. Um, I would like to be her. Well, not exactly, but <laughs> we would like to do, we'd like to do what she has done. Um, uh, and, and, it, and, uh, and again, it's fair to say, I think, that she established, she reestablished uh, Soviet history in a different way, uh, fully revised our understanding of what the Soviet period was. Others were there too, but I think it was Sheila Fitzpatrick at the forefront. And, um, um, and, then, um, and then opened herself up to revision, which is the sign of, uh, of a very successful career. Now I think we have a plurality of approaches, which is good. I think we'd all agree. Um, but even the revision, the sort of the, rev the, the post-revisionists, as they're called, um, uh, are, are, are using the methods that were introduced by, by Sheila Fitzpatrick so many years ago. Her most recent book, um, and she's going to speak on sort of a part, a part of that book, I think it is, um, her most recent book concerns uh, the problem of um, um, uh, sort of leadership and um, uh, Stalin's team, um, uh, which, is, uh, which is appropriately titled uh, something about living dangerously, which, <laughs> which it was if you're in Stalin's leadership. But today's talk is called The Team Without Stalin, and Collective Leadership, 1953 to 1957. The problem, in other words, of what the Soviet Union became um, after Stalin's death. Uh, Sheila Fitzpatrick, please come to the podium, and thank you very much for coming. Now, what, what about mics? Do I need to talk to into this one? You can do that, or you can take. Or this. let me take that one. Yeah. I think that's much better. I hate those things because then I dis I disappear behind uh, behind the rostrum. So, Yanni, thank you very much for that uh, that that very very kind intro introduction. What I'm talking about today, I'll actually, it is the team without Stalin, but I'll give you a bit of the team with Stalin too at the end. Uh, and it is indeed coming out of, um, out of my work on that, um, that, that, that book on Stalin's team, The Years of Living Dangerously in Soviet Politics. And the subject there is a group of people around Stalin, essentially the Politburo, uh, not exactly the same, that's why I don't call it the Politburo, formed uh, the group found uh, the faction formed in the 1920s to fight the other factions after Lenin's death uh, it's a group of course that won the fight and became uh, give or take a bit uh, Stalin's Politburo as well as the core of his social circle which I think is is uh, something quite interesting for the next 25 years uh, now note that length of time it is a long time in politics for uh, in any kind of politics for a group to stay together in the circumstances of Stalin's Russia it is somewhat remarkable I think um, uh, now Stalin uh, within the team uh, uh, my argument is not uh, that we should look at the team because it was really the team that was running it no on the contrary Stalin was very definitely the boss of his team uh, but he does like to operate when in uh, sort of almost daily con consultation with a group of people whom he whom he meets as a group, not individually. Uh, so this is, uh, in, in other words, 
maintaining the f the form of collective leadership, uh, which which uh, belonged to the Lenin period and was to be revived in the uh, Brezhnev period. Now, as for the team, Stalinske Kommande, Kommande is the Russian word I have in mind uh, there. Um, some people see them as Stalin's yes men. Uh, and in my book, I argue that they were individually and collectively more than that, uh, especially in the first 10 years and during the Second World War. Uh, uh, but uh, be that as may, they certainly showed themselves to be more than Stalin's yes men, when after his death in 1953, they took over as the collective leadership, that was the term they used, accomplishing a strikingly successful transition, I don't know why they never get any credit for this, without significant political or social instability, and most remarkably, embarking immediately on a wide-ranging uh, set of reforms uh, normally attributed to Khrushchev, who was initially a junior member of the team. Uh, now, as I said, my talk today focused ma mainly on the period without Stalin, that is 53 to 57, uh, especially the first of those, 53, 54. But towards the end, I'll raise the question of what the behavior of the team after Stalin suggests about its internal political dynamics in the late Stalin period, in the post-war period. So the new government was up and running even before Stalin's death on March 6, 1953. It was actually self-constituted in Stalin's office uh, uh, the day before his death as he lay dying of a stroke. Malenkov was chair of the Council of Ministers, which were this, they were, uh, this was understood to be the top job, uh, with Molotov, Bulganin, and Kaganovich as his first deputies. These are all long-standing team members. Uh, uh, Molotov had been in disgrace. He's brought back from disgrace, same for Mikoyan. Uh, Beria uh, takes over the security ministry or the two security ministries which emerge uh, at the same time. And uh, I'll, uh, I won't run through the full list um, of, uh, uh, of who was given what, uh, but it is very striking how it's all set up while Stalin's still even alive, uh, set up without Stalin's uh, participation. Khrushchev is a secretary of the party central committee. He is not at this point first secretary or general secretary. He is just a secretary. And the team pro proclaimed itself a collective leadership. The pecking order to be deduced from contemporary newspaper reports was Malinkov, Beria, and Molotov. So the team, Malinkov, Beria, Molotov, Fedoshila, Fushov, Bulganin, Kaganovich, and Mikoyan, all to be seen in an illustration in my book, carried Stalin's coffin at the funeral a few days, days later, their faces as expressionless as had become usual in post-war appearances. Eulogies were delivered by Malenkov, Beery, and Molotov, only the last showing any emotion about Stalin's loss. Now, for the team's young adult children, I pay quite a lot of attention to uh, wives and children in this book, uh, Stalin's death seemed, quote, a cosmic tragedy. That's from uh, one of the Mikoyan children. Uh, Stepan, the eldest. And Mik uh, uh, Stepan Mikoyan told his father proudly that he had attended all three days of the viewing of Stalin's body, expecting to be praised. He was shocked by his father's curt response. Zria, you were was wasting your time. <laughs> For 30-year-old Stepan, quote, it was the first signal that there could be a critical attitude to Stalin and that my father had that attitude. Now, on Stalin's death, uh, Evgeny Yevchyshenko later wrote, the whole of Russia wept, so did I. We wept sincerely with grief and perhaps also with fear uh, for the future. Uh, trained to believe that Stalin was taking care of everyone, people were lost and bewildered without him, which is what you'd have expected the team, but actually they didn't behave that way. Huge crowds gathered in Moscow trying to get to the Hall of Columns where Stalin was laid out, causing bottlenecks and panic in which hundreds were trampled to death. The new leaders seemed at first to be tensely anticipating disaster, virtually pleading with the Soviet people to resist panic and disarray. But actually, the Moscow tragedy, which was not a political demonstration, but a failure in, in crowd control, was the worst of it. The team's confidence grew and the mood changed. The American journalist Harrison Salisbury noted that, quote, the most astonishing thing that happened after Stalin died was the quickness with which symptoms of a thaw 
appeared. He uses that word Thor before it comes, before we think of it as existing. Within months, if not weeks, the team had started to show a kind of euphoria, according to Salisbury and other observers, behaving in public not with the old stiffness required in the Stalin days, but in Edward Crankshaw's uh, words, a British journalist, like children let out of school. And Crankshaw says, the new masters of Russia were positively unfolding, blossoming like leathery cacti. They might well have been euphoric. Who would have thought that the Soviet Union could achieve a peaceful transition after Stalin's death? A real collective leadership, at least for the time being. Moreover, one launching on a coherent, wide-ranging reform program with Stalin scarcely cold in his grave, uh, or indeed practically not dead when they started it. Uh, uh, the magnitude and surprising nature of the team's achievement has often been overlooked, partly because in the end, the team was to fall apart with bitter mutual recriminations, and for various reasons, nobody had any interest in, in emphasizing the fact that they had functioned as a, as a team. The apparent consensus within the team on necessary change covered a wide gamut. Gulag, uh, this includes gulag, too big, too expensive, needed to be sharply reduced, was sharply reduced almost immediately. Urban living standards needed to be raised, burden on the peasantry reduced, measures taken within the first six months. Police repression must be eased, relations with the West improved. Similarly, very, very quick off the mark on this. The anti-Semitic campaign of Stalin's last years must be called off, which it was within three weeks. And something done about excessive Russification of government in the non-Russian republics, also very quick, uh, quickly undertaken. The, the new leaders showed us a strong sense of themselves as a team that needed to act together. And this is perhaps a, a throwback uh, to, to the 20s when their sense of themselves was above all as the group that had to preserve unity. Whereas these factions, the Trotsky, the Zinoviev, you know, they're breaking the necessary unity of the party uh, uh, in, a, in a time of crisis. Well, here too, the sense that unity has to be maintained is very strong on the part of almost all, not everybody. Um, uh, their embrace, the team's embrace on Stalin's death of the old principle of collective leadership might be regarded simply as a prudent agreement to put the inevitable succession struggle on hold in the first dangerous months of transition, but I argue it was more than that, at least for most of them. Collective leadership was the opposite of something for which the team at the time of Stalin's death evidently felt something like revulsion, namely the arbitrary power of one man. Overt attacks, public attacks on Stalin were still in the future. But in the spring of 1953, Soviet citizens still mourning the lost leader were disconcerted to find that Stalin's name, formerly ubiquitous, had vanished from the press. In June 1953, there was a, a total of one mention of Stalin in Pravda, whole month. Uh, his familiar words of wisdom were no longer quoted in editorials. And people wrote in the Agiprop department correspondence boxes full of people writing in saying, what's happened? You know, where, where is Stalin? Uh, this wasn't the only sign that a new era had begun. Crankshaw's use of the term Thor for 1953 is not anach anachronistic. In fact, the relaxation and liberalization usually associated with and claimed by Khrushchev was in fact a collective leadership product that came into being four years before Khrushchev succeeded in ousting the rest of the team in 1957. Uh, now, I've already uh, indicated that within a few weeks of Stalin's death, the convicted, convicted defendants in the doctor's plot, uh, Kremlin uh, doctors, most of them Jewish, publicly accused in January 1953 of treasonous cooperation with foreign intelligence and attempts to kill the nation leaders, they were announced to be innocent. They were not just released. The announcement was made they were innocent and immediately released. Uh, an amnesty for non-politicals led to the release from Gulag of over a million prisoners. Molotov's wife, who had been arrested in the late Stalin period for Zionism, was swiftly returned by Beria from exile in Kazakhstan. Feelers were put out to the West, beginning in the eulogies at, at, at Stalin's funeral, actually. And by mid-year, a truce was signed, ending the Korean War. Uh, in August, Malenkov started talking of detente in the Cold War. Diplomatic relations with Israel and Yugoslavia that had bro been broken were restored. Rapid derussification of government in the non-Russian republics, along with encouragement of the use of indigenous languages in place of Russian, was underway by June, leading to a remarkable shakeup in administration in Belarus, the Ukraine, the Baltics, the Caucasus, and Central Asia. 
government offices throughout the Soviet Union went back to a normal workday. They had been uh, uh, constrained to follow st uh, Stalin's nocturnal habits in the last uh, years of his life. In the late summer and autumn of 1953, taxes on peasants were lowered, procurement prices on agricultural uh, goods raised. For the urban population, the government announced a major expansion in the consumer goods sector, with production of radios tripled, furniture doubled, all types of clothing significantly increased, not to mention the promise of the first domestic refrigerators. Now, sometimes we look at reform measures and we assume, yeah, everyone must have been really pleased to hear of these reforms. Uh, not so. Uh, there's a lot of criticism of many of the reforms. The Gulag amnesty, for example, very popular in, in, uh, uh, among those released, uh, but it terrified ordinary citizens in Siberia and the Urals, faced with an influx of penniless, desperate characters without jobs or housing because they, 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 released, they, they didn't do the release well enough to, uh, to organize that. Street crime rose, generating a law and order panic that spread throughout the Soviet Union and lingered on for many months. The release of the doctor's plot defendants was equally unpopular. Uh, only a minority, mainly from the intelligentsia, mainly Jewish, applauded. Uh, I'm, talk I'm basing this statement on letters that came into various central government offices and to the leaders themselves. Many pub members of the public had seen the anti-Semitic campaign as a long overdue attack on a serious social problem, that is, Jewish privilege. And Stalin's death seemed to them simply confirmation of the charges that enemies had been systematically killing off their leaders. Uh, the, in the doctor's plot, it was said they were killing off the leaders. Since then, Stalin has died, which seems to prove the case. So how come you're releasing them? That was the tenor of many of the letters uh, that came in. Molotov was the man looked to by the team as their senior member, uh, just as he had been in 1941. Uh, um, uh, when, um, uh, when the German attack briefly put Stalin's leadership into question. Uh, he received many letters uh, in the weeks after Stalin's death, calling on him uh, to step forward uh, and, uh, and set things right. Molotov, however, showed no signs of challenging the collective leadership. The experience of decades had made him as much a team play player as a Stalin acolyte. It had made him both things at the same time. Uh, in the first weeks of the transition, as Dmitry Shapilov remembered, he was a, um, a non-voting member as editor of Pravda of the Politburo, uh, oh, then called the Presidium, and uh, he seemed not even to be trying to define his role, but rather waiting, quote, with his consummate self-discipline and cultivation uh, for the collective intelligence of the team to do it for him. The others were equally keen on team solidarity, fearing, as Mikoyan, a team member, remembered, that the public would pick up on any signs of factionalism within the team and anarchy would result. Now, Malenkov is the nominal head of government, and he too turns out to be a team player. Uh, Shapilov noted that Molotov routinely brought for decision of the Presidium issues that would uh, earlier have been decided after consultation of the team uh, 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 with Stalin. It was not a difficult switch for him. You know, he's basically bringing it to a similar body, but, but Stalin isn't there anymore. Uh, as head of the government, uh, he presided over Presidium meetings, making a point of conducting business democratically, doing his best to obtain consensus, and refraining from pushing his own status. Although Malenkov was seen abroad as a likely emergent leader, Shapilov emphasized how naturally and sincerely, unquote, he played the role of team coordinator. Quote, I don't think he had any thoughts about strengthening the role of his own person. This in turn, this of course makes sense in terms of Malenkov's own past work experience. He had always been a dutiful executant and facilitator for Stalin, never one to strike out on his own or to challenge consensus, and now he was transferring these skills to a new playing field. There were, however, glaring exceptions to this remarkable display of team-mindedness. Beria was the most glaring head of security. Even as Stalin died and Beria abruptly rushed off uh, back to town, uh, Mikoyan remembered thinking that he had, quote, gone to take power. Uh, the, the speed of the reform legislation in the next few months owed a great deal to, to Beria's frenzied pace. 
Within six weeks, as head of the security police, he had released the Jewish doctors, investigated the death of Michael's head of the uh, Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, and informed the team of Stalin's involvement in that death, in that murder. Uh, forbidden the use of torture in interrogation that was to prove useful for him himself, uh, transferred much of the MVD's industrial empire to civilian ministries, and set in motion the release of more than a million prisoners from Gulag. Moving on to nationalities policy, Beria pushed for an astonishing tempo of de russification in the republics, starting with the Republican uh, uh, security agencies. The Latvian MVD was ordered to replace all Russians in senior positions with Latvians within one day. And when the locals objected uh, that there weren't that many Latvians uh, with good security records without compromat in their dossiers, uh, the instruction was to go forward regardless. Now, de-Russification was the team's policy, not just Beria's, and others were working on it too in the spring of 1953. But the reactive upsurge of nationalism in the republics was alarming, as was Beria's arrogant behavior. He had always been known for his sharp tongue, but now he was sometimes shouting at other team members in the presence of subordinates, taking unilateral actions, such as signing an instruction for testing of the hydrogen bomb on his own authority without telling his nominal boss, uh, not even telling his nominal boss, Malinkov. Khrushchev was angry when Beria started to, to interfere in party matters, uh, party appointments matters, that is, trying to put his men at the head of the Ukrainian and Belarusian communist parties. There were disagreements on Germany, uh, where the fledgling GDR was in trouble, and Beria scoffed at the notion that socialism was even a reasonable Soviet objective in Germany. Even Beria's initiatives that the team really approved, like the release of the Jewish doctors, somehow grated. Kaganovich remembered. Uh, he, was, he, Beria, was talking as if the rest of them were irrelevant. Quote, I am the authority. I am the liberal. After Stalin, I give the amnesties. I make the exposés. I do everything. In addition to feeling bullied by Beria, the team was frightened of him. As the man in charge of the secret police, he was presumed to have the dirt on every one of them in his files. It was Khrushchev perhaps a team member least cowed by decades of I intimidation by Stalin by virtue of his long absence and comparative independence in the, uh, running the Ukraine, who took the initiative, organizing Beria's arrest at a presidium meeting on 26 July 1953 uh, with a military team headed by Marshal Zhukov in the next room. Now, this is the beginning of Khrushchev's ascent, the um, disposal of, 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 of Beria. But, I mean, he acts on behalf of the team. Interrogations over the next six months, uh, next, well, five months, uh, produced uh, interrogation of Beria and his associates, produced actually little that was politically intimidating, but lots of information uh, about his sex life. So that if you read Politburo, Diel of or whatever it's called, you, you can find not only descriptions of Beria's sex life as, to, as seen by others, but his sex life as seen by himself and uh, uh, his own justification for it. A, a unique. Uh, source in Soviet history, perhaps. Uh, nevertheless, in December, a closed military court brought in its verdict, guilty of treason, anti-Soviet conspiracy, terrorism, and spying for a foreign power. In other words, working for the Muslim Musavat parties, counterintelligence in Baku back in the Civil War, hence by extension for the British. It was clearly a verdict in the spirit of the old Stalinist trials, rather than one dictated by the weight of the evidence the death sentence was carried out immediately. The team, with the poss possible exception of Mikoyan, who never liked executing people, had come to see Beria's elimination as necessary, that great catch-all category of Marxist thinking, but they were not anxious to revive Stalinist traditions of bloodletting, uh, and uh, Beria was to be the last Soviet political leader, a loser in the leadership stakes to be killed, the only one uh, to be killed after Stalin's death. Now, as far as public opinion was concerned, Beria's execution and subsequent damnation uh, turned out to be a master stroke on, on the part of the team. It wasn't that Beria had a particularly bad reputation in the country before. Uh, down in the Caucasus, they liked him. There was a whole cult of Beria in Georgia. Uh, he was also well regarded by prisoners, ex-prisoners and their families, a not insignificant sector of public opinion. Uh, because of the amnesties and mass releases from Gulag. 
To be sure, another section of the public associated him with the release of the Jewish doctors and hated him as a crypto Jew, possibly responsible for Stalin's death in the, the opinion of many who wrote in. But for most Soviet citizens, he was not really sharply differentiated initially from the rest of Stalin's associates. The public relations coup was that in getting rid of Beria, uh, 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 that when this happened, people took the execution of the head of the security police uh, allied with the contemporaneous destruction of regional secret police do dossiers from the Stalin period as a sign that the new leaders were trying to repudiate Stalinist repression. An added bonus from the team's point of view was that henceforward all past acts of repression, including the great purges in which Beria was essentially the cleanup man rather than the executor, could be laid at Beria's door along with Stalin. We were drunk with joy, Shapila, from members of the period after the remo removal of Beria. That confident, he says, that Leninist norms could be reestablished and the marvelous building of socialist society completed without the shameful defamations imposed on it by the Yuzhovs and the Beria's. For Shapila and Khrushchev, along with the old gang, uh, the founding members of the team, Molotov, Kaganovich, Vodoshilov, and with less dog dogmatism, Mikoyan, the marvelous society that was to come into being was by definition and es essence socialist. Now, Beria had been more open-minded about that. He was not, a, uh, uh, maybe socialist, maybe not, I would think would be the way he saw it. Uh, and that's the same may have been true of, of Melenkov. Part of their euphoria, no doubt, was just relief at a, f a threat lifted and a tricky maneuver brought off. Uh, but Khrushchev couldn't stop boasting of his brilliance in the Beria op operation. He was a changed man afterwards, people reported, more self-assured, more dynamic, and with a new confidence that having initiated the action, he had shown himself to be the most energetic and decisive in the team. Before the Beria affair, he had ranked fifth in the leadership, with very little name recognition outside Moscow and the Ukraine. Now he moved up into third place, after Malinkov and Molotov, no doubt with aspirations to move higher. We look to the future with optimism. Radek Khrushchev, remembered, daughter of Nikita, a journalist like her husband, uh, uh, Alexei Adjube. We believe that we could do everything, that in our country everything could turn out all right. It was the beginning of a decade, later to be called the Thor, when reform-minded journals would dedicate themselves to truth-telling about past and present, and poems like Yevtushenko could fill football stadiums for their readings. Now, in this period, in, 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 in the general sort of uh, spirit of goodwill and, uh, uh, and, and easing up, socialization within the team, <laughs> within the leading team, was one of the watchwords. Uh, and and uh, just to put in a sentence of explanation here, lots of socialization among Stalin's team was characteristic of the first years uh, of the Stalin period uh, when they all had young families and they met at the Dacha. The socialization continues, but men only heavy drinking late night, as you've all read in Gilas and so on, uh, in the later uh, period. Well, Khrushchev is trying to revive family so socialization of the team and Brezhnev also does that. Uh, the Malinkovs were family friends of the Khrushchevs at this period, as were the Mikoyans. Khrushchev did his best to, re to establish similar relations with the Bulganians and the Zhukovs, uh, Marshal Zhukov. Now there, the things founded a little bit uh, for the reason that Nina Khrushchev, Khrushchev's wife, disapproved of Bulganin and Zhukov because they had abandoned their old wives and had new wives, so she didn't want to socialize with them, so he had to do uh, Khrushchev had to do that on his own. But the Gre gregarious Khrushchev was the initiator of team socializing during vacations down in the Crimea, starting in 1953, when the Khrushchevs, Vodoshilovs, Kaganoviches made, quote, quite a big and interesting company, though not without undercurrents, as Yekaterina Vodoshilova, Vodoshilov's wife, noted in her diary, which is a, 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 an interesting source for this period. Uh, Malinkov, perceived by many in the outside world as Stalin's potential successor, seems in fact to have been quite happy working within the collective framework. Khrushchev's son Sergei later formulated this as a negative. Malinkov, he said, had never in his life led anything. He'd always served under somebody, deferring first to Stalin, then to Beria, then to Khrushchev, not to mention to his strong-minded wife Valeria at home. 
The man who, by contrast, instinctively felt that he, he had the leadership gene was Sergei's father, Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev was not pleased by Malenkov's growing popularity as one who had lifted the economic burden in the pe peasantry and pushed for more consumer goods for the towns. By the second year after Stalin's death, and tensions between the two men were rising. Personal relations firmly good uh, deteriorated because of the hectoring, condescending tone that Khrushchev now adopted to the embarrassment even of his own wife and son. Uh, the sniping between them, mainly initiated by Khrushchev, was not only felt in the Presidium, but could also be guessed by attentive newspaper readers, since Khrushchev had started to contradict Malenkov in public on issues like nuclear war. Unthinkable, in Malenkov's opinion, survivable by socialists in Khrushchev's, uh, although he didn't, uh, in these cases, mention Malenkov's name. Molotov and Kaganovich who disliked Malenkov, uh, disliked Malenkov, suspecting him of lacking deep socialist commitments, and saw so Khrushchev as a better socialist, however unpolished, abetted the conflicts with a tendency to favor Khrushchev's side. His close relationship, Malenkov's close relationship with Beria, was cited against him, as was his, quote, cheap pursuit of popularity by promising more consumer goods. Malenkov was finally pressured into resigning the premiership in January 1955, though he remained a member of the Presidium. Stalin's legacy was an issue that remained to be publicly addressed. Although Beria's 1953 amnesty had not covered political prisoners, they started to be released from Gulag on an individual basis in 1954. Victims, or more often wives and children of highly placed victims, were beginning to make their way back, petitioning individual team leaders to help uh, their political re uh, team members to help their political rehabilitation, to get apartments in Moscow and so on. Now, Miko Yan, always generous, uh, was deluged with petitioners and helped many of them. From 1954, he headed the official commission on rehabilitation. But there was nobody on the team, however stony-hearted, who was exempt from contact with the victims and the painful and guilty memories they aroused. Uh, the former exiles and prisoners brought back shocking stories of their experiences. The two who had most impact on the team were Olga Shatunovska, Alexei Snyegov, both old Bolsheviks whom they knew from way back, uh, with long-standing connections to the team members uh, arrested during the Great Purges, spending 20 years in Gulag. Khrushchev and Mikoyan, in particular, were strongly influenced by these two. Uh, tireless who were in tireless cr crusaders for public acknowledgement of Stalinist repressions and, at least in the case of Shinyago, are not above a bit of implicit blackmail to the leaders they talk to. Go public on Stalin's crimes or you'll find yourself under accusation, was Shinyago's mes message to Khrushchev. In the tense lead-up to Khrushchev's secret speech at the 20th Party Congress in 1956, the question of which members of the team were the most culpable along with Stalin, and which the least, was a crucial subtext. Khrushchev later liked to claim that the secret speech and the de-Stalinization that followed it was his own initiative. His initiative was in there, to be sure, as was Mikoyan's, but it was also a team, a collective leadership effort, albeit a hotly contested one, uh, with regard to details. The basis for Khrushchev's revelations was a devastating 70-page report commissioned by the team, the Presidium, in 1955 from Piotr Paspielov, a Central Com Committee Secretary who had edited Pravda in the 1940s. Now, Paspielov was regarded as something of a Stalinist, so it was a major shock when he came back with a report laying the blame for unleasing the great purges and sanctioning torture during interrogations squarely at Stalin's door, but also making clear that other Politburo members besides Stalin had seen copies of interrogation protocols and uh, arrest lists and knew about the torture. Between 1935 and 40, the report said, almost two million people had been arrested for anti-Soviet uh, activity and 688 688503. Anyway, nearly 700,000 had been shot. Khrushchev was appalled when the report came in. His son wrote he had expected disclo disclosures, but nothing on this scale. With Paspielov's report in hand and the 20th Party Congress uh, scheduled for February 1956 imminent, the big question for the team, and I stress there is a collective dis discussion about this, this issue, how much should be released of, of the information in the Paspielov report, and to whom? To the party, the country, the international communist movement, the world? 
Uh, the Presidium held an anxious discussion of the Pospielov report on 9th of February 1956. In Hrushchev's version, he alone, he was the sole rapporteur, uh, it isn't true, Mikoyan was a rapporteur as well, arguing passionately his version that it was impossible to ignore the evils of the past and keep innocent people in the camps in exile. Verdashilov in Hrushchev's version furiously attacked him uh, if so, it's been it's not in the protocols. Uh, supported by Kaganovich, uh, saying that making the uh, Pospielov report known to the Congress would have a terrible effect on the parties and country's prestige. Uh, so we we have a report. What we have is Khrushchev's detailed report of went of what went on, which may or may not be accurate, and a much shorter report uh, in the in the uh, protocols, uh, which indica indicates some. Uh, which indicates discussion of tricky issues and ultimate consensus on the fact that uh, that uh, the, the, the substance of the report should be released to the 20th Party Congress. Now, while the decision on disclosures about Stalinist repression was consensual, team members had different ideas about the story that ought to be told. Molotov wanted Stalin's achievements to be included. In other words, on the one hand, on the other hand. Uh, 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 as well as his crimes. Mikoyan thought that the narrative should be that up to 1934, Stalin behaved like a hero. After 1934, he did terrible things, although he wasn't quite sure about collectivization, where to put that in that story. Malinkov was against the 1934 break, and no wonder, because he didn't come on board until after. It means his entire political career would be in the bad period. Uh, and he recommended focusing on the cult of personality which would allow them really to reinstate Lenin. This was, of course, what they did. Uh, uh, so this is a Malenkov formulation. Uh, Mikoyan later felt aggrieved, not without reason, at Rushoff's appropriating of all the credit for the deci decision to come clean. In fact, Mikoyan was the first to touch on sensitive issues at the Congress itself, with his acknowledgement that, quote, after a long break, collective leadership has been created in our party. But it was Rushoff's speech on the final day of the Congress that stunned the delegates in the world. Freely based on Pospielov's report, uh, Rushoff's speech was delivered on, on behalf of the whole presidium, but contained significant additions. Uh, there is in Ragani a, a, a text with his em emendations, which one uh, can compare to what he actually delivered. Uh, the Paspiel of focus was all on the great purges, all that stuff on the war and Stalin's mistakes, especially when he dis disagreed with Rushoff, that is Rushoff, uh, added probably not, uh, the other leaders probably didn't know he was going to do it. And he added perhaps uh, with uh, team consent, uh, the Leningrad affair and the um, post-war repression. Uh, but uh, uh, my, my basic point here is that the, um, uh, the de-Stalinization, which we always put squarely on, in the Khrushchev camp, is, uh, uh, is also uh, b basically belongs uh, in this reforming collective leadership mold. Though Khrushchev pushed it his own way, and of course then he up and run with it, with it sub subsequently. Now in the concluding section of this paper, I'm not going to go into detail about the waning days of collective leadership, which lasts until 57, when actually the entire Stalin team uh, is, uh, wants to censure Khrushchev for non-collegial, non-collective uh, behavior, and, uh, and he outmaneuvers them, with Mikoyan going on to his, over to his side. But what I'm going to do, I'm not going to talk about that, I'm going to go back to the last years of Stalin's rule and see what, in light of the developments after Stalin's death that I've discussed, may look different from our normal picture. For the broader party and population, Stalin's standing had never been higher than in the post-war period. He had led the country to victory in the war, the Stalin cult flourished, and was received with new enthusiasm by the population. In the context of high politics, Stalin's power, in the sense of ability to co-opt and oust uh, others to and from the leadership team, uh, was also undiminished, although I'm going to introduce a slight question mark uh, to that in a minute. Moreover, he showed increasing signs, he showed signs of increasing suspicion of his colleagues in the team, which in his last years put the personal and political survival of Molotov and Mikoyan and probably other team members in jeopardy. Stalin, in other words, was no less dangerous 
uh, to them and to others, no less, less lethal than he had been in the 1930s. And probably as far as the team is concerned, he was more dangerous. At the same time, he was a sick and aging man whose work capacity was sub substantially impaired compared to the pre-war period. He spent more and more time in the South, an average of almost three months a year from 1945 to 1948, almost five months in 1950, and finally no less than seven months from August 1951 to February 1952, he is outside of Moscow. In other words, he is not directly running most, uh, most uh, government business. Even when he was in Moscow, his working day contracted sharply. He stopped chairing the Council of Ministers. He made mistakes that nobody dared correct, forgot names. Uh, the team were not only his top political governmental associates, but also, as I've said, his social circle. Khrushchev speaks of him at this period almost as one might a demanding el elderly relative who needs to be, well, babysat. I had to spend all my time with him on vacation, Khrushchev complained, sitting over endless meals. Whenever I was offered up as a sacrifice, meaning the person who had to go on vacation with him, Beria used to cheer me up by saying, look at it this way, someone has to suffer, it might as well be you. <laughs> Stalin's handed over more and more business to other team members, just signing off on whatever they decided when it was sent to him at the Dutch or in the South for signature. Uh, this created log jams and procrastination, but more importantly, led to a revival in Stalin's last years of what Alek Lyubnuk has called semi-collective decision making on the team's part. In other words, the collective part of the uh, the collective aspect uh, comes back with Stalin's um, um, diminished role or constricted role. Uh, according to one inside observer, I think this is an exaggeration, but uh, he claims that a group of four, Beria, Malinkov, Khrushchev, and Bulganin, was in effect running the Politburo Presidium, not Stalin. Of course, Stalin had veto power, but he complained uh, to a minister, somebody leveled down below, the, the next one down, he complained that the team was agreeing beforehand on the policies that were br they brought for his approval, concealing the, the, the disagreements among themselves, which he always wanted to know for control purposes, and uh, essentially behaving as if they had an implicit understanding that once Stalin signed off on something, they would work out their differences and they would determine what the actual form of it uh, would be. Now, that is not to say that Stalin was out of the picture in, the, in, the, uh, in his last years. He still had the key power to kill, including, although this required careful preparation on his part, team members, as one can see from the Vesnitsky case. He could still la la launch bold initiatives that nobody on the team dared stand, stand against if Stalin had shown that this really mattered to him. One of them was the anti-Semitic campaign of his last years. Very much Stalin's idea and uh, pushed through with uh, um, against the sil silent dis disapproval of most of the team. Uh, it's one of the few issues that seem not to be, have been discussed with the team. Stalin was dealing directly with the security people uh, on this. Now, in addition, it looked as if he was gunning, he, Stalin, for team members Molotov, long his number two man, and Mikoyan. Uh, but this, if that's so, it's uh, this, this Stalin initiative, uh, I mean, I think it is so, but, uh, but note um, how long it takes. Uh, in Molotov's case, Stalin is showing signs of, 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 of unhappiness about his increased status abroad and so on uh, in 1945 already, and he's still around uh, when Stalin dies, so this is seven years plus. Uh, in Mikoyan's case, the, the sort of obvious uh, unhappiness with him uh, 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 is four years at least. Now what's interesting about this process is not only that if Stalin wanted to ask them he was taking so long about it, uh, but the fact uh, that their ouster appears to have been effectively resisted by the rest of the team. Uh, and that is an unusual uh, uh, situation because basically Stalin had had both the power, uh, over time he had always had the power both to co-opt and to push people out of the team. Now Khrushchev tells part of the resistance story in his memoirs. According to him, Stalin became annoyed with Molotov and Mikoyan and wanted to exclude them from the team's important informal meetings. Uh, so he stopped inviting them. But other team members told them when the gatherings were on and they showed up anyway. This went on for some months, 52, uh, despite Stalin's protest. Finally, he managed to stop it 
But his, at his regular 1953 New Year party at the Dacha, Molotov and Mikoyan still showed up along with the rest of the team, though uninvited. Now, Stalin had always sought team consensus on exclusions from the inner circle, uh, one of the reasons they were generally so protracted. I mean, think Bukharin, uh, which is another sort of six, seven year effort uh, in, in, in the end of the 30s, on in to uh, end of 20s, on through 30s. Uh, in this case, he, he presumably is seeking it, but he doesn't seem to be getting it, getting this support for uh, the exclusion of Molotov and Mikoyan. Khrushchev doesn't really explain why the rest of them acted as they did. But Beria's son, in his memoirs, provides a possible explanation that team members, notably Beria, Bulganin, Melinkov, and Khrushchev, quote, began to appreciate that they were all in the same boat as Molotov and Mikoyan, and it mattered little whether one of them was thrown overboard a few days before the others. This generated a new spirit of tom team solidarity. They agreed among themselves, this is Beria, uh, the son, not to uh, allow Stalin to set one against it an another, and that they would immediately inform each other of anything Stalin said about them so as to frustrate his manipulations. Now that's probably a sanitized version. Uh, but both Molotov and Mikoyan supported, or something like it, in their later acknowledgement uh, that Beria and others were implicitly uh, supporting them uh, in their problems with Stalin in his last years. Further evidence for this lies in the fate of Stalin's attempted institutional reform of October 1952, which was intended to sideline side Molotov and Mikoyan, accused of uh, essentially of being British spies, but allowed to remain on the pr presidium, uh, by creating a new bureau of the party presidium, which had been previously the Politburo, from which they were excluded. So the notion is that the bureau of the presidium is going to do all the work. And this is in all the books about how it was created, uh, and the assumption is that that's what it looks like. But actually in Ragani, we've got the sort of protocols. They've, cu they've come down from the presidential archive. And it wasn't really like that at all. Uh, it, it seemed the, the, the Bureau of the Presidium was meant to meet, um, I think, every week. It only did that for a few, a few weeks, and then it lapsed. Uh, the big questions were meant to be kept out of the full, uh, the full um, presidium. Uh, and yet the big questions are all discussed at a meeting uh, in December, uh, uh, at which Molotov and Mikoyan are present and actually make um, uh, some quite important contribution. Now, Mikoyan says that he even went to a Bureau of Presidium meeting. That is not evident from the protocols. Uh, but I think basically Malenkov kind of squashed the whole Bureau of Presidium notion and went back to the Presidium uh, as, as the key, uh, the key uh, adv advising uh, consultative body. Now, with regard to policy making in Stalin's last years, uh, Joram Golitsky and Elie Klyvnyuk in uh, Cold Peace conclude that some kind of implicit understanding seems to have been emer to have emerged in the inner circle, that what he calls what I call the team, uh, that policy changed policy change on a range of major issues tensions with the West, living standards, peasants, gulag, nationalities, was desirable but could not be achieved while Stalin was around. This, of course, is difficult to confirm directly. Uh, nobody has found a smoking gun, like a memorandum of an agreement. We, don't, we, uh, we think lots of things were changed, but should be changed, but can't do it while Stalin's alive. Obviously, they, they, nothing like that has turned up in the archives. The archivists uh, who know the uh, Ergani stuff better than any of us can do, uh, they say there isn't anything like that, uh, there, that there. And of course, if there had been, if there had been any indication of an agreement among, any written indication of uh, agreement among team members that Stalin's um, policy needed to be changed on a range of things, I mean, that would have been uh, understood by Stalin as conspiracy. Uh, it would have been conspiracy uh, and uh, would have led to very um, sharp consequences. But it seems to me that... Um, one has to assume that despite the absence of any evidence, which uh, I've said it is virtually impossible that, 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 uh, that any direct evidence would, have, um, would ever be forth forthcoming, there must have been some kind of implicit consensus about future reform actions within the leadership. Uh, the, the best proof of which is the speed with which the collective leadership, once Stalin was dead, embarked on them. You know, these are broad, these are wide-ranging reforms. You, you, you really couldn't do it unless uh, 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 
first of all, there is no indication of a lengthy process of of um, of, of, uh, of of sort of not, uh, working them out. Uh, they seem to be, to some degree, already pre. Uh, pre-planned or pre-thought out. In other words, you know if you change policy how you're going to change it, evidently. Uh, uh, one has to assume that some kind of implicit uh, consensus uh, existed, otherwise the collective leadership could not have behaved when it did, would not have behaved like that when Stalin uh, died. So assuming that such an implicit consensus existed in the team and Stalin uh, sensed it, as he almost certainly did, it's no wonder that Stalin was dissatisfied with his closest colleague in his last years. We actually don't need to introduce any argument about paranoia, actually, with regard to his colleagues. Uh, consider the last sentence of Khrushchev's account of Stalin's unsuccessful attempts to drop Molotov and Mikoyan from the social circle. After some months of resistance from the team, at which Stalin became uh, increasingly annoyed, quote, without bringing the subject up among ourselves, we decided to wait for the natural outcome of this situation. And now what could the natural outcome be but Stalin's death or his removal from the leadership for incapacity? It's something that would allow the team full reign. The team usually behaved like yes men to Stalin in his later years, but it was uh, yes saying with important qualifications as Stalin evidently perceived. The point of saying yes was not to follow Stalin's wishes slavishly because of their devo devotion and trust, but rather to keep him happy, to give way to him on his hobby horses, like the Jewish question, and suppress all signs of team disagreement so that he couldn't play them off against each other as was his wont, while getting on and doing what the team thought was necessary under and under the present circumstances achievable. Some matters could effectively be de decided by the team as they saw fit, Others, including the big issues, were too, too tricky to tackle while Stalin was around, but were temporarily shelved rather than abandoned. With a team in this mood, I don't wonder that Stalin, breaking the pattern of, 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 of the last uh, five years, failed to go on his normal vacation in the summer of 1952. His behavior at the October 1952 plenum looks as if he was planning a showdown with the team. Whether he would have won, we don't know. Death removed him from the scene at the critical moment, uh, leaving the team in charge. You would be lost without me, Stalin liked to tell his team. But when the time came, contrary to his and perhaps their expectations, they weren't. Um, you can feel the archives speak to you as you listen to him to talk like this. Uh, someone I hope will ask about sources and about data because this is these are the, obviously this is access to, to people who see these documents. Um, we have and now this is New York, right? The entire city has ADD and it has no restaurant at a certain point, right? Mm -hmm. So we have about twenty minutes for questions. Following which, whoever wants to stay can go ahead and, and have lunch in the in the lobby. Uh, I'll start us off with a, with one question of interpretation to clarify what it is that you're arguing. Mm -hmm. So the um, as I understand it, you're saying that the the idea of collective leadership. Um, uh, preceded 1953, and there was something about the late Stalin period that allowed for some sort of collective solidarity um, and collective leadership um, um, below Stalin, right? And I'm wondering if this, if you're arguing that this is somehow systemic, um, or mm -hmm. if it's happenstance because of his health, um, how would you, how would you characterize that? No, no, I would argue it is sy systemic. Although I wish that somebody would look at the Lenin period in such a way as, as, as to give us a sense of how he worked with his team. I. He's always wor he's always working with, first of all, a central uh, as first among equals unquote, uh, in the Central Committee. Then later on, it's the Politburo. So the Leninist style of leadership, as understood by the people who remembered him, I mean Molotov uh, of, of the Stalin team, Molotov, uh, Kalinin, Voroshilov, um, uh, and Stalin, of course, had worked with him, and so their model of how of how Soviet Soviet things function is that there is a top man who is deeply respected, but he is nothing like a dictator. He doesn't claim personal dictator um, uh, um, uh, powers. Uh, his, his authority rests on, on uh, his uh, a, a, a election along with the rest of the Politburo or Central Committee by the party as a whole. Now, at the top, this I think is understood, uh, I mean what this is understood by is that there, there's a leader 
who doesn't have a title of personal dictator and whom we don't think of it like that. And he exists within this Politburo uh, uh, or Central Committee as earlier in Lenin times. And so that's the natural, the Soviet way of doing things. He has, in Lenin's case, he has unchallenged, in a I mean, he has, everyone assumes he has the greatest authority among them, but nevertheless, the convention of first among equals uh, is maintained. Now, I think Stalin is following you know, th 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 this is following a Leninist pattern and the others too. Now, over the course of two or three decades, a lot of things happen, including the Great Purges, which I, uh, I argue is a, is a Stalin initiative that the rest of the team goes along with in a mood, uh, a mixed mood of admiration and appall because they don't know, I mean, they are themselves potential targets. They're also implementers. Uh, they, they do, most of the team comes through unscathed, which is very important for my uh, general view of the things, but they don't know that in advance. Now, obviously, something like the purges changes the way something like a team operates. But what I find crucial is that Stalin continues uh, all through this period to meet s several times a week with this group. I'm not talking about Politburo meetings. He met with them as the Politburo, yes. Uh, but Pilitro meetings are big, you know, as many as are in this room with all sorts of people from the, from the commissariat to come in to argue their case and so on. They also meet in Stalin's office, the smaller group. And there you don't have, uh, you know, th these are small, small group meetings and they are in a sense the, the, well, they're the team meetings, but they're also in a sense the effective Pilitro meetings. Uh, how much um, scope other members had for input? varies. Uh, th during the war, by the way, it comes back quite large and purge is way down. Uh, uh, in the war, up again. Um, uh, Post-war, down again. But the point is that collective leadership, in, in, in other words, the functioning of the leader with a group like the Politburo, is considered by the people on that team to be part of the Soviet way of doing things. Therefore, collective leadership is not, as it sort of appears in the, in the books, a new idea that they sort of put out in 53 when Stalin dies. It's, 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 it's their notion of, of, of how things function without the deformation introduced by Stalin having gone off the, you know, gone off the rails to some degree. I'll start over, thank you. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what you learned from paying such close attention to the wives and children's accounts, um, not only in terms of specific information, but just in general, your, your picture of what was going on, how it was affected by those sources. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, very much the question of socialization, the question that this is a political unit that's also a social unit, much of the time. But its nature as a social unit changes over time. But uh, as I mentioned, Khrushchev tries to, to return to the first bit he remembers. That is the, the, you know, the beginning the beginning 30s. So that's one of the things I gain. Uh, the, um, another thing, uh, which I, did, I didn't include in this argument at all. It's sort of separate in the book. It's, it's, I, I, I was very struck by the fact that the children of the leaders, uh, almost uniformly, uh, well, only one of them does anything like going into politics. And then they, that's Zhdanov's son, and then against Zhdanov's wishes, and because Stalin pushed him into it. Uh, they go into terribly intelligent you know, uh, 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 occupations. There are quite a few professors. They do, you know, they philologically uh, fakultiert at Moscow University is the standard. And incidentally, many of them study, do American studies during the war and fall in love with America. But uh, I, above all, they, they conceive of themselves, the children conceive of themselves as intelligentsia. I thought that's interesting because by the post-Stalin period, when the children are grown up, children mainly grow up in the 40s, uh, by the post-Stalin period, the team is, of course, very cut off from anybody but their, the people they work with and their families and their children. And I was struck by a passage, I, I start to think about this by a passage in Molotov's letters to his wife in which he says, uh, from Svetlana, his daughter, who's now at university, we can see that the younger generation has X and Y and they're just like this. And th so uh, it, in other words, this intelligentness of the children has got to be to a certain, uh, it, it's, 
it's made the milieu in which the leaders, leaders are operating a kind of quasi-intelligentsia milieu, by which I don't mean to say that, it, that true intelligentsia outside would have recognized them as such. I'm talking about, uh, uh, about how, the, uh, how the children conceived of themselves and, and, and how, in a sense, this potentially rubs off on the, the parents, on some parents less than others. Rushoff uh, was not receptive to influence from his children, <laughs> and uh, I mean, which you can even document. Because all the children, uh, it, all the children, for example, have the intelligentsia view that Lysenko is a charlatan and, and, and support for him is a very bad thing. And so the various ones, uh, uh, children go to their parents and they explain this. Uh, the Mikoyan sons do this and, and I probably even Svetlana uh, Molotova did it to her father. And Sergei Khrushchev goes and explains to her tries to explain to Khrushchev that Lysenko is no good. And <laughs> Khrushchev just dismisses him, yeah, get out of here. Uh, so, you know, the, he, he's by far the, le the most impervious to this. Um, but all the rest of them, uh, there's, a whole, there's a whole postscript about their life after power, um, because, you know, some of them lived on into their 90s. And as far as I can see, they're being taken by their children to chamber music concerts at the Malazal of the Conservatorium. With now, exactly what one does with this little image, I don't know. But anyway, I just uh, throw it out. Um, it was a very interesting portrait of the team protecting one another, trying to make sure Stalin didn't play one off against the other while waiting for him to die or become utterly incapacitated. But in the records you've looked at, do you get any sense of how they're jockeying? Uh, among themselves to come out on top once Stalin isn't there, or is that kept out of the record as much as talk about reform? Well, uh, here we come to the question of what, what our, our, our records are. Well, two points. One, um, the emphasis on how uh, understanding the threat to the whole team that represented by the, d the apparent disgrace of Molotov and Mikoyan, they thought they'd better hang together or they'd all hang separately. The things they're saying we will not do are the things they have in fact been doing. In other words, being allowing them to be manipulated into, into, um, into bitching, you know, you know, the scorpions in a bottle behavior, uh, which culminates in the Vesnysinski uh, um, uh, execution. Vesnysinski is kind of, he's, Stalin has brought him in as a team member. It's not clear to me that the rest of the team really accept him, uh, but uh, th there's, uh, He's, he's, he's a kind of quasi-member, uh, and he falls victim in, um, in, in the late 40s. Now, about the sources. Uh, of course, you never, uh, you almost never have good sources about politicking and, and plotting against each other, except from the people concerned. Say, in British politics, I was just reading a review of, of, of a, a, a biography of Margaret Thatcher. Well, you know, you, you could really describe who was, who was plotting behind the scenes with whom. In the Soviet case, uh, it is much harder. Uh, you have some memoirs, and I have to say that Khrushchev and Mikoyan, by writing memoirs, have put themselves, have proven it, it was a very wise step, uh, because, you know, I, I mean, we know stuff. We know their version of things. Molotov only gave interviews to Chuyev. Kaganovich was interviewed by Chuyev too, but too late, uh, when he was, he was already very old and sort of choleric and all he would say, you know, it's a lie, it's a lie. <laughs> you know, so Chuyev didn't get that much out of him. <laughs> but we also have the, the, the fine Russian tradition that um, the parents of any notable, I mean, the children of any notable parent have, or somebody in the family must take on the duty to tend the flame and to write a memoir showing that the father uh, was, you know, was all, what all he did for the best. And we have a number of these. Uh, Rushoff's son, Malinkov's son, Beria's son, uh, everybody writes these exculpatory memoirs of their father, which, which have information, some of which may be quite wrong, but, uh, you know, I mean, that, that's all we have. And there is one, the only exception, uh, the only team member uh, who didn't have a loyal child uh, to do this was Stalin himself, uh, whose, chi whose memoir writing child, as you know, was Svetlana. Uh, but all the others are in the tending the flame tradition. Anne O'Donnell. I was wondering if oh, I was wondering if there is this systemic quality to the collective leadership. How then 
does that quality move forward in time? Perhaps that's a bit unfair given that you, your talk ends in 1957, but what's the end of it? What's the denouement? Oh. The denouement with Rousseau. I think that it's, it's, it's got to be in the British era, actually. Or I, I mean, there is a, as I've given talks around the place, I mean, some people uh, put their hands up and say Putin operates like this too. I cannot express an opinion on that. But Brezhnev clearly had a notion of collective leadership which includes not only getting consensus within the Politburo uh, on policy matters, but socializing together. Uh, and Susanna Schattenberg has been uh, working on this and showing this very clearly. Uh, and he thinks he's in a Leninist tradition, presumably. Now, Rousseff is interesting because Rousseff is the man uh, who doesn't seem to have this sense that collective leadership is the way you do it. And I think that's partly because uh, because of the Ukraine. He was in the Ukraine for so long. He wasn't in Moscow. And therefore, he, he attended far fewer of these meetings. I mean, you didn't fly in from Kiev to attend team meetings. You uh, people, and, and uh, both the Leningrad and Ukraine people, Kirov the same, you know, they're often out of it. Uh, because they're in their in their respective places, uh, so he 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 is not as socialized to the, the 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 forms of collective leadership as some of the others. He was junior, of course, um, uh, for um, and, and really until he comes back in uh, in fifty three. And he and Beria are the two people who seem to want to be number one and are not interested in the question of collective leadership. Beria they deal with very quickly, and as I said, that's what makes Stalin's name, killing Beria. I mean, makes it, gives him authority, uh, uh, changes his status in the team. Uh, in 57, Stalin, uh, <laughs> Khrushchev's behavior, Khrushchev is censured for non-collegial behavior by essentially the whole team, including his future supporter. Mikoyan, and including Zhukov, who's a key player in, in, in enabling him to win. Uh, the trouble is, I th I, I, and the censure, I mean, it's, it's a minor, it's, a, 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 it's an overwhelming majority of the presidium against Khrushchev, but he appeals to the Central Committee and, um, uh, I mean, he appeals outside of it. I think the reason there, the, the, you know, the, the team is by this time, you know, they're old, they've been around for three decades. Uh, the Molotov, uh, Molotov, Kaganovich, Brodoshilov, and et, et, et cetera. I think there, you know, Khrushchev is looking the livelier, you know, the younger man, the, 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 the more vigorous or whatever. But what interests me particularly is in 1950, Khrushchev, after all, only lasts for, um, what is it, seven years or so, but before he is removed, with exactly the same criticisms being made of him, that he violated the spirit of collective leadership. He didn't understand that a leader operates with a collective. Uh, and, and then comes Brezhnev, who not only reestablishes the collective leadership, but um, in, a, in, a, uh, in a much more collective form, I would think, than had ever existed, including under, under Lenin, but certainly under Stalin. So that's what I, I see the denouement of my story uh, being, in a sense, the, uh, uh, the demonstration under Brezhnev uh, of uh, a sense within the top echelons of the party that a proper way of running things involved both the leader and the collective around him. Uh, one more, uh, Rosin Jagalov. Uh, yes. Um, the, recently, there have been several Stalins, Oleg Levnyuk's, uh, Kotkins, which uh, so far goes up to 28, but will probably continue. And uh, a little bit earlier, Simon Montefiore's, and, and you are now yours, and uh, with the risk of putting you in a polemic with, with all these, how are these different Stalins and their teams different? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm the one with the team, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, uh, Levnyuk, in a certain sense, has the team. Not, of course, in the recent book, that uh, the recent book is a biography, so he's not in, but earlier, it, uh, the inner circle, he's uh, actually a little bit unhappy. Uh, Livnuk knows more than anybody else about this period. I, I absolutely bow to his, 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 his authority on this, but I think he's, he, he's perhaps overcautious in thinking of it as a collective leadership, and this is partly because he thinks within a, a sort of a Russian framework where he's afraid that sort of, I think, 
that introducing, pointing out too much to the, to the fact that the inner circle is a kind of collective leadership, that would appear to uh, diminish the responsibility of Stalin and, then the, and the, the sort of indictment that goes with it. That's what, if you look at the framing of the new biography, that's very much there, that we must, what we publish shouldn't let the Soviet public think that Stalin wasn't a terrible man responsible alone more or less for a whole lot of stuff. So I, I don't think we have a difference of reading of the, um, of the material at all. And if, if, if we did, I would be very worried because he knows it so well. Uh, as for Kotkin, I, I, I reviewed it in The Guardian and it was a very favorable review. I, um, I uh, what, what can I, what? Well, it's, very, it's funny to me. I mean, he, he has, he gives the back of his hand to everybody, except Star I mean, Stalin is the clever, cleverest. Stalin is the is you know no signs of the future monster. Uh, Trotsky is awful. Um, Zinoviev is is pathetic. Even Karmenev is awful. Bukharin is stu is silly. Lenin is no good either because he doesn't understand. Anyway, it's a very funny. I mean, I'm of course wildly parodying what he's doing, but but the Stalin in Volume One. Uh, is is the competent, reasonable man, the man that clearly would have had Kotkin's vote had he been. Uh, <laughs> so um, my question about Kotkin is, what are you going to do in volume two? <laughs> uh, and, and who's the, oh, Montefiore. Well, I, I actually think, um, I think the Montefiore uh, biography is very good. And uh, he's got, uh, you know, he d he's not interested in the team at all, but he is interested in the socializing. And he got that, first, you know, he was the first person who noticed that socializing of Stalin with the people. And uh, and he, you know, regardless of, um, I mean, okay, he's a journalist and we're all scholars, so we're kind of better. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and, and whether or not he did his own archival work, I think that archival work was well done. And I knew those archives, uh, you know, even when it came out. And so whoever did it, did it well. And so I think you know, uh, good book. Um, we're actually out of time, but if anyone wants to approach the speaker afterwards, uh, she'll be here for another almost an hour. Huh? Uh, the two more biographies coming out, one by Reber and one by um, Hoffman. They're, bo they're both working on uh, Stalin books right now. Well, there's also Babarovsky. And Babarovsky, yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that right? That one I didn't even know about. All right. Thanks very much. Mm.